it's going to take a long time to change cultures, worldviews, etc. And I think one of the things that in our work is that we just try not to get too bent out of shape about the history, because you know at the end of the day, if we kind of exist in that space, it'll burn us out really quickly. All the folks that we work on our team have all kind of grappled with being frustrated with the history, but also like that frustration on the left that's translated into some sort of action just basically starts corroding the vessel that it's in, you know, and, and it's very easy to become cynical. This is Yonder Lies, unpacking the myths of Jackson Hole. I'm Hannah Haberman. And I'm Jesse Bryant. You're listening to part two of our Indigenous Pasts, Indigenous Presence episode. Today, we'll be hearing from three incredible Native leaders who are leading the way in wildlife conservation and restoration, in the pursuit of justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women, children, and people, and in the outdoor recreation industry. Through advocacy, science, storytelling, and lots of hard work, these three folks have helped make their communities safer, more joyful, and more just. Their dedication to education of Native communities and building bridges between Native and non-Native communities is really, really inspiring. Each of our guests today is driven by a passion for addressing pressing issues that face Native people today. The work they do is inseparable from who they are. In sharing these stories on the show today, we hope to elevate the great work these leaders are doing and inspire you to learn more. We hope that you'll notice the ways in which these stories resonate with you, and also the ways in which they may speak to experiences far different from your own. Later on, we'll hear from Lynette Grable, whose work combats the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women. We'll also hear from Len Nessifer, who is merging an Indigenous worldview with the outdoor recreation we all love. But first, we'll hear from Jason Baldus, who is Eastern Shoshone and lives on the Wind River Reservation, and who's been instrumental in the reintroduction of bison there. Jason is a friend of mine, and his work, along with the work of his father, Richard, has been essential for land management on Wind River for decades. His story is one of generational love for the outdoors and forward-thinking conservation that not only benefits the ecosystem, but also helps to heal people. Here he is. Zan Zikandaivi, good afternoon. My my name is Jason Baldus. I'm a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe uh, from the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming. I uh, currently work as the Tribal Buffalo Coordinator for the National Wildlife Federation. I sit as the Region 1 Director uh, on the Board of Directors for the Intertribal Buffalo Council, and I serve as the Eastern Shoshone Tribe's Buffalo Representative. My dad, he grew up on the Wind River Reservation and in, in Riverton in particular with a tough background history, you know, as a, as a Mexican and Native American family. And he remembers a time when, you know, he could walk down and catch a fish and several species of fish down in the Wind River, down just below the Vadio, they called it, in Riverton. And he grew up with a a family that loved to hunt and fish, uh, camp. Uh, That was customary, you know, the majority of the summer was spent doing that. And eventually worked in in Montana and Arizona and, and then eventually back home. And as a federal employee, as well as a tribal member of the Eastern Shoshone Tribe, it gave him a unique opportunity to uphold the federal trust responsibility through that agency for the tribes, in particular for, for fish and wildlife. And so, you know, the, the reservation has a history of conservation success. For instance, the, the wilderness area established 26 years before the Federal Wilderness Act. The, a lot of the language that's in the Federal Wilderness Act came from the designation of that Wind River Wilderness Wilderness Area. Wow. That's really cool. The fact that some of the language and ideas in the Federal Wilderness Act, which has helped to create more than 750 wilderness areas across the U.S., has its roots in the Wind River Roadless Area. That area was established in 1938, a whole 26 years before the Wilderness Act was passed. Yeah, I never heard that story before. So Jason's dad was super instrumental in establishing the game code on Wind River, which basically reinstated agreed-upon hunting seasons and harvesting quotas. Prior to 1984, populations of pronghorn antelope and bighorn sheep had been significantly reduced because hunting was unrestricted. Establishing the game code was pretty contentious, as you might imagine. Jason told us his dad was repeatedly threatened and at one point even shot at. But despite the controversy, the game code worked. 
Richard predicted that intentional management would allow these species to rebound to a point where tribal members would be able to eventually hunt more than one animal per species per year. And that's what happened. I remember being a youngster and my dad saying, we're going to hunt these antelope, antelope in uh, 10 years. I killed my first one eight years later, and I've killed one every year since. The management of those wildlife species has set the stage for conservation, and today our tribal members have access to more than enough meat in, within our wild game populations to sustain our families. I was, I was very uh, privileged, and uh, I feel very fortunate to, to have had the upbringing I did and to be able to do the work uh, that, that he started. And uh, it's because of my dad that I'm, I'm in the work that I am now. We asked Jason about what inspired him to build his life around bison. He shared a story about witnessing a mass wildebeest migration in Masai Mara, Kenya, with his dad. And we drove for over 100 miles on dirt roads, and as far as you could see in every direction was wildebeest, and then about 36 other species. Uh, one day we counted 88 hyenas, but you see impalas and gazelles and leopards and cheetahs and, and giraffes, and it's incredible. But what was more unfathomable to me was that that's less than 5% of what the bison or buffalo was here less than 200 years ago. And to come back and understand the story and the similarity between the history of how the buffalo was treated and how Native Americans were treated, it's very similar. We're now on isolated pockets of our once former vast territories, uh, buffalo in parks and refuges and private ranches, and Native Americans on reservations. And the separation of that food source, the separation of that gift from God, uh, as we see it through our ceremonial ways, then, then we have suffered for over a hundred years with, with the absence of that animal from our lives. And so as we begin to bring that animal back, uh, we also begin to heal. And in that healing, you know, it's the hope that the, this place will be a better place for our future generation. I think with, with scientific uh, expertise and background uh, that exists today with, with technology, uh, as well as social media, we're, we're really able to spread the, the news and the word about the importance of buffalo and bison restoration to tribes and, and how that's not only about uh, healing of Native American people, it's, a, it's an American story. And, you know, Americans need to know about it. One thing that came up over and over again as we talked to Jason was the need for a paradigm shift in how bison are viewed. Bison are now thought of as a commodity, like livestock, in a way that's so different from how we think about elk or moose or deer or even bighorn sheep. For many people, bison now are more like cows than wildlife. They're put on private ranches, marketed, manipulated genetically, they even have cattle genes introduced. For Jason, helping to shift people's understanding of bison away from this livestock framework and instead back to bison as wildlife is essential for the health of, well, everyone. We have to begin to uh, embrace this animal as, as wildlife to, to allow landscapes uh, to, to have this animal so that it can benefit not only people but the ecosystem. As a keystone species they benefit a host of other organisms from birds and, and mammals to amphibians and lepidopterans and arthropods. When we put this animal back on the landscape it not only heals the landscape but it heals the connection that we or our forebears uh, removed. And a lot of it was in terms of a land grab. In order to acquire the land of the United States, they had to eliminate the food source of the native people who were here for millennia. And we are still healing from that. And what better way than to bring this animal back into our lives? I think that what we're doing on tribal lands uh, and through sovereignty and implementing sovereign, the sovereign authority of tribes by reconnecting with this animal, allowing larger landscapes to hold bison in terms of a wildlife restoration effort. All we have to do is put this animal back into its habitat because wildlife, wildlife management is a lot less about managing the wildlife than it is about managing the people. We have the habitat. It's the people we have to worry about. And so encouraging and, and uh, educating our, our own people about the importance of this animal, not only for ourselves, but for the, for the landscape as a whole, that's that paradigm shift. If we look at the indigenous lands held worldwide, they hold 80% of the world's biodiversity. That's, that's 
that's not by accident because of the worldview uh, that Native and Indigenous people have about our connection to the land and the, the plants and the animals and the air and the water. And we as a society are disconnected from that today. Buffalo can help everybody in that way. In addition to the challenge that this disconnect of people from land poses, Jason also pointed to the way in which the mosaic of fractured lands managed by different agencies makes it impossible for bison populations to look like they used to. But at the same time, the existence of public lands means that reintroduction is a possibility in the first place. Jason also emphasized the importance of creating community between the producers ranching and farming bison, other stakeholders like cattle ranchers and wildlife agencies, and those who want to see the animal respected as a wildlife species. And, and so we got to find common ground, though, because we have that common interest in buffalo. And oftentimes there's 80% of the things we agree on, and we have 20% differences. That's okay. I think that through partnership and collaboration and, and in finding common ground, uh, that's, that's the best approach in moving forward. There is a, a lot of commonality, though, uh, in, in those because that, that buffalo is what brought us all together. And I think if we focus on those things we have in common instead of our differences, uh, then we're gonna be able to move forward in terms of what's best for the land and, and best for buffalo. And in terms of the historical importance, best for helping educate the American people. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Think WY, Wyoming Humanities. Wyoming Humanities supports programs, grants, and initiatives in Teton County and across Wyoming that explore history, culture, and the human experience. To learn more about the Wyoming Humanities Council, visit thinkwy.org. Again, that's thinkwy.org. What jumps out at me most from Jason's story is the connection between land and people and that ecological restoration is also truly social restoration. And I also love how it expands that group healing to include not just Native Americans, but all Americans. In our previous episode, we mentioned how Wind River is shared between the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho peoples, despite the fact that the two tribes were historical enemies. While Jason is Eastern Shoshone, our next speaker is Northern Arapaho and also calls the Wind River Reservation home. And like Jason, she's working every day to make life on the reservation better for everyone. Lynette Graybull is a leader in education and cultural healing. She's a truly remarkable human whose organization, Not Our Native Daughters, works to combat the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Although she originally started off in the finance sector, she says it was a simple census report, of all things, that changed the course of her life. Before we hear from Lynette, just a quick heads up. This next section deals with sexual assault, trauma, and violence. If any of these topics are triggering to you, we encourage you to take care of yourself and take a break from listening if you need to. Here she is. My name is Lynette Grable. I'm Northern Arapaho and Hukpapa Lakota. I reside here at the Wind River Reservation. Um, I wear a lot of hats, but if I was to be called anything, I take pride in being called a mother. I'm a mother of three beautiful children. I named my organization Not Our Native Daughters because I look at all girls and boys as my own children. Um, and back in uh, 2010, the U.S. Census Bureau released a, a census um, research and data on Native American communities. Um, and in that data and research, uh, we topped the worst statistics in the nation um, as far as, um, you know, we had the lowest life expectancy rate in Native Americans, um, the highest youth and children suicide rate. We live in the poorest counties, the, the top 10 poorest counties in the U.S., you know, lack of employment, lack of resources. Um, you know, one of the things I always say, you know, I when I present or even speak is that, you know, I'm a full-blooded Native American woman, um, but the, the statistics that hang over my head is that I am the most stalked, raped, sexually assaulted, and murdered out of all ethnicities in the nation. And no matter how many times I say that, it, that gets me emotional, um, but it also drives me. It also builds my ambition to change that statistic. 
so in the course of learning this data and research, kind of consuming it and really taking it personal, I chose to left the finance industry to pursue advocating for indigenous justice. And that's when I formed Not Our Native Daughters. Um, I wanted Not Our Native Daughters to be an organization that was um, Native American led, um, but also was able to reach out and build capacity. There was a big disconnect from the uh, Native American communities in the U.S. Um, and I wanted to build a capacity and bridges and, and dialogues and partnerships and collaborations so that uh, we be, can be able to understand for those who are non-Native, understand their Native neighbors, and also understand the, the, the challenges that we still face. Although the MMIW epidemic may seem like a new hashtag on Twitter, Lynette says this has been going on since the start. You know, the selling of North America's uh, indigenous women and children for sexual purpose has always been an ongoing practice since the colonial era. Uh, there's evidence that early British surveyors and settlers viewed Native women's sexual and reproductive freedom as a proof of their innate impurity. And that many, m- many assumed the right to kidnap, rape, and prostitute Native women and children without consequences. The MMIW movement, uh, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women movement started in Canada because of their huge rate of missing and murdered persons there. And it, it closely relates to U.S. tribes as well. We have a high epidemic of violence against women, violence against children. And to add to that, we have jurisdictional issues. You know, usually if something happens in your city or your town that you live in, whether it's rural or in the city, you know, you can call the police, you can call 911. And, and those types of uh, resources are not always available for us in Indian country because we have the the government uh, BIA that leads our law enforcement um, and our law enforcement you know in the BIA defense they're not fully funded to kind of handle some of the issues uh, uh, especially 911 issues and public safety issues within Indian country so a lot of victims don't get justice. The MMIW movement, um, I would say, has always been an issue, but I'm, I'm so glad we're in this, this place in our society where not only Native American communities are talking about it, we are talking about it as a whole, as a community, you know, as, as it relates to state and federal levels. And even in Congress, you know, right, we were working on bills of Not Invisible Act and Savannah's Act. And so I'm glad that people are starting to talk about it. And I'm also glad that people are willing to learn about it as well, because I do fully believe that it takes community well-being. It takes all of us to build community well-being and uh, public safety within our community, both rural, uh, non-tribal, and, and just overall, overwide. It takes all of us as, as citizens. The Not Invisible Act was introduced to Congress in 2019. While the Not Invisible Act seeks to set up intergovernmental systems and establish best practices for law enforcement to address the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic, Savannah's Act is aimed at changing law enforcement protocols and data collection methods for the crisis. As of February 2020, both bills are waiting to be heard by Congress. Lynette shared some of the challenges facing the MMIW movement. A huge lack of funding, lack of visibility, and the complex and tangled web of jurisdiction. Felony crimes in Indian country, such as murder, oftentimes go to federal law enforcement like the FBI, Homeland Security, or even the U.S. state attorney, which can make things much messier and complicated. Not only that, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which heads law enforcement in Indian country, is highly underfunded and often lacks the resources to adequately respond to these sorts of crimes. One of the things I always say is, you know, if we talk about one issue that we face, we have to talk about all the issues because they're all interrelated. It's like peeling an onion. You know, if you're going to talk about our missing, murdered, indigenous persons, and we're going to have to talk about the, the poverty. Why are we vulnerable? Why are we targeted? Um, why is there a lack of resources? You know, it's just everything down the line. We have to talk about the different elements that makes those risk factors apparent. Um, in the in the issues, and since I've uh, been doing the work, I've been bombarded with with the stories of missing persons. You know, I, I was uh, sharing some statistics today in, in the in the presentation that I did this morning at CWC, um, and I had a combative student who was kind of challenging some of these statistics and. You know, I, as, as kindly and gracefully as I could, I went in depth in some of those statistics. Come to find out, this young man 
was in his defense, he was just being triggered because his mom has been missing since 2003. Mm -hmm. So just today in my presentation, there's an, another victim that I know about, another story of, of somebody from Arapaho, somebody within our, our Wind River community um, that's a missing and, and nobody has done a thing about it. I think I would have some hostility and some misplaced grief uh, when it comes to especially your own family mother or even your own mother um, that's been missing. And so these stories are common. I hope that these cold cases and some of these missing cases that have lain, laid dormant for a very long time begins to see some, some light or at least some attention so that there is some comfort to these families, not just of the Red River Reservation, but just nationwide. There's a lot of stories of, of missing, of murdered, uh, with no conclusion. There has been no follow-up with law enforcement or even victim advocates that was working on the case. Um, I hope to bring those those connections to those families because that, that was somebody's mother, that was somebody's daughter, that's somebody's niece, that's somebody's son somewhere. And it's a heavy burden to carry, but I hope that justice will prevail in the midst of all of this MMIW awareness. I think the education of it um, is, is a big factor in it as well, which this, this is what I do. I get consulted to train on these issues. But, you know, like I stated before, you know, I hope in the midst of me doing these trainings and education and teaching um, that in line in the fabric of everything that I train on that there is a call to action to it you know I, I, I am never concerned of who wants to get involved what their background is whether they're native or non-native um, I do believe it takes a community to create justice uh, it, it takes a community to organize um, and even lead up to leading up to legislation I love Lynette's emphasis on community building around justice. This idea that it really does take everyone, native or non-native, to make a change. We all need to help, and especially in Wyoming, I think non-native people need to understand that these issues are happening to our neighbors. We've got to pitch in. We do. And we've also got to try to be a little more honest about the more sinister issue here, racism. In my work, specifically in the Northern Plains region, um, one of the common factors of the lack of justice uh, for Native Americans and for Native American communities is the racism, the blatant racism. That plays a huge factor on the injustices of the crimes and the things that, the issues that we face. It's not, you know, people don't like to talk about racism. In these Northern Plains states that I just mentioned, primarily the primarily races in these states are Native American and white. Um, they take up most of the population in these in these re in this region. And so, what I've been able to identify in my own state of Wyoming is the blatant racism. Uh, there's generational racism here. There's historical racism here. So there's a big, huge disconnect from the Native American community and through the outside. And a lot of that stems from from the racism. You know, if somebody from our community, even if it's a child or young lady or young man, goes missing, you know, our stories don't make it to the evening news. However, if somebody, a young girl or young lady from Jackson goes missing, um, or even Cheyenne, that story will make it on the evening news. So there is a disconnect from media publication to the crisis that we face, being those stories being told. There's a, there's a lack of a fairness in that and diversity and inclusion in that and again this is not a topic people like to talk about it makes people uncomfortable you know uh, that's the reality as a native american living in wyoming and i i do believe we can heal that um I, we heal that by talking about it and and bringing that up um, not to place blame and not to condemn an entire race but to say hey this is happening um how can we work to change this I, I love the quote that, you know, injustice one place is injustice everywhere. So, you know, I believe in it takes all of us to, to make that change. Um, and we definitely can understand more, more and grow more. And this is what leads to building a better community. If you don't know how to get involved, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to talk to anybody who's interested in on, on 
the promotion and education and awareness of missing, murdered Indigenous uh, women and girls. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Wildlife Expeditions of Teton Science Schools. For over 20 years, Wildlife Expeditions has been leading educational wildlife tours in Jackson Hole, Grand Teton, and Yellowstone National Parks. To see wildlife and support education, visit wildlifeexpeditions.org. Talking to Lynette was really inspiring, and for real, I'd encourage folks to reach out to her if you want to know more. I think this is an issue that we all need to know more about. It's real, it's happening now, and we all need to show up to combat this disproportionate violence and lack of justice. One of Lynette's main focuses was on education and helping raise awareness around the MMIW crisis. Similarly, our next guest, Len Nessifer, is working to educate and raise awareness around Indigenous perspectives and history, but in this case, in the world of outdoor recreation. He's an activist, an educator, a skier and a climber, and his vision for the merging of a Navajo worldview with the enjoyment of the outdoors is truly quite stunning. Here he is. Len Nussera, University of Arizona, Native Outdoors. A decade ago, I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Kansas and basically kind of spent the last few years trying to figure out what I was trying to do with my life as, you know, as most 20-year-olds do. But yeah, so I, I kind of headed down the path of doing aerospace research and worked at NASA Glenn for a hot second and just kind of learned that like the more hardcore engineering path was not my deal. I mean, I don't like spending, you know, eight, eight ten hours in front of a computer every day. I, I remember the way I would relate to that job in Cleveland when I was at NASA was just, I was, you know, go to work, do that. But I was just so psyched to go mountain biking right after work. And that's what I looked forward to every day, and I just, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of been a, being outside has been kind of a theme of my life um, for quite a while. So, you know, looking back even further, basically, it was, I grew up with a father who really valued the outdoors. He was, <clears throat> grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Um, he was a surfer when he was a young man and lived in San Diego in a van, so OG van lifer. Um, and my mom came from the Navajo Nation. So that side of the family, we were, you know, mainly traditional healers and ranchers, farmers. And so a lot of the time I spent there was outside, too. And you don't talk about OG outdoor people. That's even more OG than my dad. So, But, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, like, having that sort of upbringing um, where being outside was highly valued and, like, you know, something as necessary to life, it just kind of made sense that, like, the engineering stuff didn't really work out. But, you know, in large part, the reason why I went into... So I, I, I shifted gears, applied for a PhD program. I ended up going to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and my focus was looking at energy resource development, sort of from a technical, social, cultural lens for the Navajo Nation. And so, you know, my home community, that's kind of like an ever-present impact that's basically been had on the land. Like most of the Navajo Nation has been used as an energy piggy bank for the Southwest for the past 40 years, and that's mainly been through coal, and there's been a ton of uranium mining for nuclear weapons and things of that sort. So the legacies of that are pretty real and long-lasting, and so I was just trying to figure out what's the what's the pathway for the Navajo Nation to move away from that and to, uh, yeah, just try to develop a more, a less impactful, less extractive economy. And so that led me working in energy, and yeah, and I worked at ZOE for a hot second, not a hot second, I worked there for a few years. And that job was really great under the Obama administration. An election happened and things radically shifted at the, at the Department of Energy. And so I was looking for the door out. Yeah, in large part, in Natives Outdoors was just largely to, originally it was just an Instagram account to start showing Native people doing outdoor activities. In large part, it was just trying to create a community that I didn't feel like existed. And so it's been pretty phenomenal, and you know, and, and I think in the outdoor industry, I, like I also started the company right during, well, right when the Bears Ears National Monument was being negotiated between the different parties involved, and so we got, I got pretty directly involved with that, and then when the monument was rescinded, it brought me into contact with a lot of folks in the outdoor industry. In the previous episode, we talked a bit about how there's this unspoken reality that basically all of the public lands in the United States are in some ways, also land stolen from the Native communities. We also talked a bit about how the concept of national parks and of Native reservations are, in some ways, disturbingly similar. I mean, yeah, it's like, that's definitely the history of, like, you know, public lands 
and reservations had to be created together because they had to have a park for the four leggeds and the two leggeds, you know. And yeah, I mean, I but I think kind of one of the things that I've seen broadly in the industry and 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 just across the United States in general is like literally we receive almost zero education about tribes or you know sort of the complex history of settler colonialism and like the ways in which the impacts that that's like sort of permeated through and you know the entire existence of native people and like in the lands that we're on and you know i think one of the things that i realized is that's just like it's coming from like the ignorance you know and like i can't hold ignorance against people you know because it's you know at the end of the day we exist in a system that basically isn't teaching people these important things and so you know my work i see that that as an opportunity to like meet people where they're at to do that work to educate um but also just understanding that you know when we look at uh you know and, and basically saying public lands are stolen lands it's like yes that's true but then the, then the next question is like okay what then you know and, and working with tribes and working with native nations like <clears throat> you know the idea of repatriation and land back is kind of like i think it's a really good idea i mean not a good idea but it's like kind of a really complex idea but also you know not all tribes have the capacity to manage um large swaths of land you know like it's a very different context that we live in now than as compared to 150 years ago i do believe that there's an importance of empowering tribes empowering native nations and also like making sure that they have important seat at the table and that they also have a voice in in discussions of of management of public lands um and i think bears years was one of those instances where you know tribes really let that push and like use their status as sovereign nations to create conversation or well effectively force conversations with the Obama administration the Department of Interior but the part of the reason why you know if it was just tribes pushing this i don't think it would have actually been successful despite lens success in building coalitions between the outdoor industry and tribes in the southwest trump drastically reduced the size of barriers national monument in 2017 though it was a loss for many lens says that in the long term it might have taught a critical lesson. And then when the monument was rescinded, it was great because, you know, maybe now some of these, the outdoor industry and some of these white folks understand what it feels like to lose, you know, to have land taken. You know, it was kind of this opportunity to educate. Like, that doesn't feel good, does it? So, like, I think it's and more and more deeply one of the things that that has done is it's really entrenched some of the, some of the really important work in alignment between companies like Patagonia and the North Face and, and various tribes and Native peoples in the lower 48 in Alaska. So I just think from a political standpoint, it was imperfect in some ways, but also um, it's also created lasting connections between groups that historically haven't had that sort of those lines of dialogue. Lens company Natives Outdoors has been instrumental in creating this dialogue. Not only does the organization actively challenge the dominant and obviously false idea that only white people love being in the mountains, it also helps build community for indigenous people too. And for all people, the organization helps fill the gaps about public land and Native peoples that, for almost everyone, fell through the cracks during education. One of the things that we've been doing in our work is just simply putting Indigenous perspectives out there through the lens of outdoor sport and like things like skiing or rock climbing or um, trail running. And having the sport and the visual media and the storytelling come out of it be sort of that what I like to call is the remedial education for the things that we should have learned in K through 12 education about, you know, where our public lands come from and the ways in which Native people then sort of interface with that. And so, you know, one of the things that we just simply do is we provide the worldview. People can try it on, see how it compares and contrasts, and like, you know, and, and, it, and it's through a medium that a lot of people feel comfortable with. So it's kind of a way of meeting people where they're at and also understanding that, you know, there's a lot of people that are starting from ground zero on indigenous issues. And, you know, it's going to take, you know, to have any sort of larger impact, it's going to take um, sort of swaying a lot of people. And so that's kind of where, you know, what we look at is shared and common values. You know, a lot of people love the mountains, they love the landscapes, but maybe they just don't know that there's 20,000, 30,000 years of human history underneath it. And so you know, and I, I think that's kind of, in reality, that's our secret sauce. And, like, that's kind of where we've been really able to make some big waves in the industry around, I don't know, like skiing or climbing, whatever it is. That worldview is, like, we go outside, one, to continue our connection to the, these places. And then also that these sports are not necessarily just sports for us, but they can also be forms of prayer, like being in these mountains. 
in more broadly, you know, when you look at indigenous pers- worldviews and perspectives with the innate natural world, it's more based on a relationship of reciprocity. And that's badass ski footage combined with that sort of worldview. It's kind of the, like I say, the candy. <laughs> you give the candy with the, me- you know, with the medicine. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? Yeah, but also sometimes medicine just tastes good. Sometimes we just need medicine. I think, you know, for Navajo tradition, like our entire medicinal practices is based upon like healing powers of the mountain. And like you can imagine, like you can spend an entire day in the mountains and think about how you feel afterwards. Like literally that's our entire medicinal system (laughs) is to get you to that point, you know, feeling super chill, super bliss, like content. And yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, you know, an interesting thing that I, I realized like in a lot of my outings that I take folks on, like, you know, taking these professional athletes out to these, you know, these like places that just look really, you know, I, I think to the untrained eye look really barren and stark and just kind of like, I don't want to say dead. Yeah, I guess we just say dead landscapes, you know, kind of like the wilderness, right? And just kind of then breaking it down and saying, oh, like, here's medicinal root that we use for this and this purpose like on this past trip that we did with forest you know it's the middle of winter in the middle of winter one of our the one of the folks on our team was coming down with a cold and and there's this green moss that grows on some of the pine trees they're kind of like these long woolly kind of long bearded light green moss and they just hang and and that's a medicine for us and so you know we're on the skin trip and we're trying to like go find some untracked powder in these like north facing gullies and like we just collected some medicine on the way up and you know got to the top ripped our skins off and then skied down and then when we got to the bottom we made the tea and i think like that layer of knowledge of landscape was really cool but also just like it also makes these places more hospitable when when there's that sort of knowledge that there's a lot of healing that these places can provide it to you know, in the work that we've done, one of the things that we've seen is that the more time people spend outside and like their entire identity begins to merge with that of the natural world, there's more in common with the native people than like folks that don't do that, you know. And, and I think those sort of un- being able to understand what those shared values are, I think, is kind of where I think there's a lot of potential for growth. And then and, and it also allows for the discussion of difference in a way that is more genuine and also a little bit safer, if that makes sense. A lot of the sort of outward facing work that we do is simply just trying to chip away and just like understanding that this is like climbing a really big mountain and we're just like basically at the bottom. Oof, Len's right. We really do have a big mountain to climb. Yeah, today's episode alone felt like a mountain. But we hope this has piqued your curiosity at least a little bit. We also don't want this episode to give people the impression that Native issues are only relevant to the American West. There are tribes throughout this country and throughout the world, and we hope, if nothing else, that this episode inspires folks everywhere to begin to build coalitions between people wherever you may be living. So we encourage you to learn about the issues facing Native peoples around you. Learn about the leaders there, and learn about the work folks are doing to make communities safer, more joyful, and more just. We also want to say a big thank you to our guests today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you, Len. You can find more about their work on our website, yonderlies.com. In our next episode, which will come out on February 23rd, we will be shifting gears a little bit and exploring the challenges facing bighorn sheep in the Tetons. And if that sounds a little lame in any way, I promise it's going to be a wild ride. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Technical support comes from Jackson's community radio station, KHOL 89.1, and the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative. A big thanks to the Jackson Hole Historical Society for providing access to hours of archival audio. Special shout out to Doug Haberman for our theme music and Becca Hold Hewson for our beautiful cover art. If you haven't already, please rate and subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. And if you'd like to support the show with a small monthly donation, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash yonder lies. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com backslash yonder lies.